I'm Aaron Rossetto, and uh, I'm very pleased and honored to be able to talk to you about some work that I've been doing in my spare time, which with a four-year-old and nearly a two-year-old amounts to about three and a half minutes per day. Um, who am I? Uh, I'm a former NI uh, employee. I, I maintained UHD for the last couple of years. I presented a couple of times at, at GRCon, in fact, and I've got links there. That's a picture of me, by the way, from Charlotte, where GRCon 2021 was, one afternoon when I ran off and, and had to go to a brew pub and uh, decompress a little bit. Um, and I've also presented at some GRCon related things. And I put links in here because I will be touching on some of the topics that I spoke about in these presentations as part of this presentation. So if you wanna go into more depth on some of these things, um, I encourage you to go uh, take a look at these. But I've also been a long time SDR and public safety monitoring enthusiast. And I don't presume uh, that everybody understands what public safety monitoring really is. But in short, it's simply listening to first responders in your community as they respond to situations. Um, whether it, for me, it is for entertainment purposes, whether it's informational, if you're, you know, maybe one of those good government types trying to see what, uh, uh, where your tax dollars are going, making sure, keeping the, uh, 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 keeping police in check and, and whatnot. It's basically being able to listen to their communications and the equipment and techniques uh, that are used uh, to do so. Uh, so, what does that entail? How exactly do you go about monitoring these public safety systems? Well, first of all, you need to know what frequencies to monitor for the agencies of interest. And back in the day, you could buy books uh, that were based on location with lists of uh, frequencies for police, fire, EMS, state police, road crews, uh, etc. But these days, you're more likely to go to an online database like Radio Reference, which has all of that information plus a lot more, including you know, mapping of talk group IDs to all of the users on trunked radio systems uh, and so on. And so once you know the frequencies that you want to listen, you sit in front of your receiver and you jog the tuning knob back and forth and, and you have a great time, right? No, it, it doesn't quite work like that. In fact, uh, that would kind of be a, a, a pain in the butt. So there is a specialized receiver known as a scanner that have been around for quite a while. And um, by the way, I, I just love this picture from the 1978 Radio Shack catalog that, uh, you know, vision of domesticity where they're sitting around reading the newspaper and doing some knitting in front of a roaring fire and they've got their tabletop scanner and you know, listening to what's going on in their community. Um, but scanners get their name because they have a, a list of channels or frequencies that they are programmed with or set up with, and they go through and tune each one and stop when there is traffic on that channel. So when there is a user who is transmitting, the speaker unmutes, uh, you listen to the communication, and as soon as that communication is over, uh, the scanner resumes what it's doing. Um, and you got those, those very lovely tabletop models on the left and some more mobile models on the right. And these ones required crystals. So you had to go down to your local Radio Shack and say, I'd like to order the following crystals. And presumably they would come in, in a week or so. And you plug them in and there you go. Now you can monitor your, your local uh, public service agencies. Since the 1980s, however, with um, you know, microprocessors being ubiquitous and everything and digital synthesizers, scanners bec became a lot more flexible. And now all you had to do is really punch the frequency in uh, that you wanted to listen to uh, and, and it would do the rest. Uh, they also, scanners around that time started to add features for monitoring trunked radio systems, uh, which is a whole other ball of wax uh, and is described more in depth in one of those uh, presentations that I linked to uh, at the beginning of these slides. And the state of the art for scanners look like these sophisticated devices with touch screens. They, uh, they don't list frequencies anymore. They just tell you who's talking and what uh, groups they belong to. Uh, a lot of features there, uh, very feature rich, uh, great things uh, that you can do with them. They're wonderful. 
But for the truly adventurous, there are also computer-based solutions. So Unitrunker is one piece of software that's used for monitoring trunked radio systems. DSD Plus is another. There's SDR Trunk. Uh, there's, there's quite a few of them out there if you've got the, the tech savvy to be able to set it up and to do all the configuration. And then this is something I came across a few weeks ago. Uh, somebody took a Steam Deck and they grafted on a USB... Um, a hub and a couple of RTL SDRs and turn that into a trunk radio monitoring solution. And the first thing I thought of when I saw this was, well, is this really a, a scanner? Um, uh, but ye yes, it is. And it looks like it's running SDR trunk. So, you know, good, good for that person, uh, I suppose. Um, but in my mind, all of these options have some deficiencies associated with them. And really what it boils down to is they don't work the way I want it to, right? Scanners have, uh, are, are made for uh, broad audiences, and so they have to serve most of the common use cases. There's not a lot of customization that you could do. Some of them allow serial port control, but it's, it's very, very basic. Um, on the other side, computer-based scanners are difficult to configure, uh, definitely for novices, but even for seasoned uh, uh, hobbyists, you need to have a computer, um, and you may need specific knowledge and a tool set if you wanted to do any sort of customization. Uh, and then, like I said, in both cases, they make design choices that don't serve my particular needs. Um, and so all of this was in my mind uh, when uh, I think about the ideal scanner for me. And I've presented this slide before uh, at, at a few venues, which is what I envision a DIY open source trunked radio scanner to look like. I'd thought of an SDR connected to a Raspberry Pi, um, an amplifier and a speaker in a box um, that would then be controlled headlessly through some sort of web-based mobile-friendly uh, UI. And with this much computing power, there's a lot that you can do, a lot of customization, a lot of different use cases that you can serve with this that is limited mainly by your imagination. And of course, it would be written in GNU radio um, and it would be wonderful. So keep that in the back of your mind uh, as I present this work that I've been doing because it is my baby steps towards implementing this dream scanner. Uh, when I think about the goals that I want to have around uh, you know, a customized scanning solution, it's really flexibility trumps everything else. I basically separate the, the notion of the front end, which is all the radio bits, from the back end, which is the business logic, and I want flexibility on both those sides. Uh, the front end typically doesn't change too much, especially if you've got one particular uh, system or type of system that you want to monitor, but it's the back end that changes quite a bit. And I wanted to decouple that as much as possible from the front end so I could rapidly iterate on changes without having to go back into GNU Radio Companion and change the front end just because I wanted to change something uh, in the back end. The other thing I wanted to do too was insulate the person implementing the business logic as much as possible from the communication protocol because you know, the person writing a scanner application typically doesn't care if they see these messages on the, con the control channel. What they really want is a notification that a user is on this frequency now, right? And then to do something in response uh, to that. And then I also wanted to make sure that I used a language that had a really rich library ecosystem so that, uh, you know, if I thought of a really interesting user interface or, or user experience that I wanted to implement, that I would have a, a, a set of tools or libraries at the ready that I could use to quickly prototype these things. And so with that, I created the very um, uh, boringly named GR Scanner, where GR stands for GNU Radio, not Grandpa, as you might uh, infer from this picture. Although this is a, a really quintessential Grandpa picture. If you look in the back, you could see the guy's fireplace mantle, and he's got a box of remote controls on top of that. Um, and then he's got his little scanner table beside his easy chair with a towel over the, the arm of it. And then what looks like ointments in a, a bucket on the table as well. Um, just had to, had to point that out. 
But what GR Scanner is, is uh, a GNU radio module that simplifies the creation of these customized listener-oriented monitoring solutions. So this is really meant for consumption by human beings, although that's not necessarily a requirement of a monitoring system, right? You could dump all the stuff to disk, but really the intent is um, to, to be able to easily create these monitoring applications for listening and for, for human consumption of trunked, P, specifically P25 trunked radio systems. So as I mentioned before, I split the application into the notion of this front end, which is the radio, um, and the back end, the business logic. The front end is a GNU radio flow graph that looks like a million of other, other flow graphs that you've seen, but is designed to support multiple simultaneous channel acquisition. So that, for example, you could have a control channel and a separate traffic channel, or if you had the computing and SDR resources, you could maybe have all of the channels of a particular tower all being fed in uh, to the back end at the same time. The back end, being the business logic, is a Python module that's designed to be completely decoupled from GNU radio and from the front end flow graph, where the, um, the common language of data exchange between the two are JSON messages. Because they're well supported in Python, they're easy to, to parse with the eye. It's just a, a pretty flexible way uh, to communicate data uh, in a fairly standardized way. Before I go any further, though, I want to be very clear that a lot of the code that is in the GR scanner um, out of tree module is based very, very heavily on the OP25 project. And I want to make sure that I acknowledge those authors uh, because they did a lot of the hard work of, uh, of writing a lot of the P25 framing and four level slicing code that uh, I used as part of my project. Again, in an effort to accelerate my development. So I want to make sure that they get kudos, as well as to all of the other contributors to GNU Radio, UHD, CMake, all of the wonderful open source packages that go into making this possible. All right, what I want to do now is take a look at what the front end looks like, and uh, it's pretty wide when you look at it in GNU Radio Companion. So I've broken it up across a couple of screens here. Um, on the left-hand side is, are, are blocks that run in the RF NOC domain. And I was doing my prototyping on a USRP E310, and one of its benefits is it's got an FPGA uh, in it that, uh, into which you can deploy processing blocks known as RF NOC blocks. And unfortunately, the E310 has a relatively small FPGA on it. There's not a lot that you can do there, but what I did in the FPGA was to take the radio block, which tunes 10 megahertz of spectrum around a center frequency, splits that stream of IQ data, uh, and connects those two streams to down converter blocks so that I can tune part of that 10 megahertz spectrum down to baseband. And one of those streams represents the trunk system control channel. The other stream represents the traffic channel of interest. The RF NOC RX streamer crosses the bridge between the RF NOC domain and the GNU radio domain. So everything from this point on is now running uh, on the CPU. The remainder of the flow graph, again, there, there's nothing really special here. This looks like a pretty standard common uh, narrow band monitoring application. The highlighted modules are one that GR Scanner offers. So there's a four level slicer because the P25 protocol is four level FSK uh, encoded signal, and the P25 frame decoder takes in uh, an array of die bits, so basically characters 0, 1, 2, 3, representing the sliced four-level FSK data, and outputs messages that are those decoded uh, P25 data units. And those go into sort of the first novel block, I think, uh, of this whole effort, not, uh, not very interestingly, again, called the front-end interface, but the front-end interface is what helps keep the front-end and the back-end uh, decoupled. So on the left-hand side of the block are input ports, um, and on the right-hand side are output ports. And this block has two main responsibilities. The first is to instantiate 
uh, load a Python module and instantiate a class based on one of the named, or a couple of the named parameters uh, to this block. The second responsibility that it has is it accepts, I say here PDUs, but I think I should be saying PMTs. Uh, I tend to confuse those two terms. Um, but it, it accepts those PMTs and turns those into function calls on the backend class. So that the backend doesn't need to include any GNU radio dependencies in order to do its, its work. Whenever a message comes in, it just turns into a method call on the back end. And similarly, if the back end wants to send data up into the front end uh, for, say, tuning either the control or the traffic channel, it can do the same thing by calling a function uh, that is provided by the front end interface that does uh, that conversion uh, and communication. And uh, the other thing that it does, a uh, minor but uh, nice thing, is that uh, that input channel list and output channel list parameters um, are comma separated names to assign to these ports and as you add more items to these lists the number of ports on the block uh, increases and they're by default called in zero in one in two in three uh, this is just a nice facility to be able to map one of those very generic port names into something that's a little bit more meaningful for the application so the way that this front end interface works in my p25 uh, scanner application is uh, that these JSON strings from the P25 framers come into the ports on the left hand side and invoke the receive PDU method on the loaded module, so the class, the instantiated class of the loaded module uh, with the name of the port and then basically the data that was in that PMT. And similarly, if I wanted to control the offsets of the DDCs, the radio gain, or the frequency, I can call from my backend class, send PDU function, giving it the friendly name of the port, and then data that basically gets converted into a PMT. So the bulk of the work that went into this is in the class called P25 Scanner. It's a, a well, class and module. It has no GNU radio dependencies, but it's a base class that is intended to handle most of the common trunk system decoding tasks. It will configure the front end to tune to the middle of a set of frequencies that represent a tower of interest. It will interpret the trunked control channel messages and call user-defined functions on whatever subclasses this class. It decodes the digital voice packets and sends just raw PCM data down to the subclass so it doesn't have to do uh, any of the hard codec work. And it also accepts trunked radio system files that you can download from Radio Reference if you have a membership. And it, provide, it, it parses those files and provides the subclass access to that data as dictionaries. So you don't have to uh, do all the hard work of decoding trunked group number 2468 into you know, a city patrol north or something uh, because that is part of what this class is intended to do. And so as you can imagine, you would subclass P25 scanner and implement all of your application specific behaviors within that subclass. So one thing I'm particularly proud of, uh, I don't know if I should be, I just, I, I wanted to talk about this, um, is one of the worst parts about decoding these digital radio systems is, you know, you've got all these different message types. You can go download the specs, but then you have to decode them, right? So you have to look at the, the 12 bytes of the trunk signaling message block, and then look at the op code, and then depending on the op code, there's a number of different uh, uh, fields in there and writing all the bit shifting and, and comparison stuff is a real pain in the butt. So what I ended up doing was creating what I call the decoder ring, which is a map of, of these P25 control system message names to uh, a list of fields associated with that message and decoders for each of those fields. And those decoders can be in one of two, fo uh, uh, one of two forms. It can either be a list of byte offsets, masks, and shifts for each field, which is you know, very common stuff that you need to do to uh, uh, extract the value of these fields from the raw packets, or it can be a lambda function, uh, where for some fields, 
um, the data is encoded in a specific way that, and we want to do a transformation on that uh, before we call into the, the subclass. And the example I'll give here is the frequency field of the OSP group voice channel grant um, isn't a frequency in terms of megahertz, it's a channel number. And so to convert that channel number to frequency, you need to have seen some other messages from the control channel. And that's what that uh, self.system.channel to frequency function does. Um, and you know, so you need a little bit of extra support uh, in these decoders. We'll just, just provide a callable. And then what happens is once all of the data for the message is decoded, tries to call a function in the subclass with that message's opcode name. So it will try to call a function OSP GRP V channel grant, and then each of the things in the decoder ring turns into a separate parameter on that function. Now, try that in C++. And I, I, I'm a long time C++ programmer, and I'm trying to get better with Python. And when I realized you could do stuff like this, it was, it was mind blowing. This is really powerful and goes towards that goal of accelerating my own development and, and prototyping of these different applications. Okay, the back end also includes an IMBE audio decoder. Again, this code came from OP25. It's a fixed point implementation. It's not the greatest sounding, um, but you know, it's, it's definitely armchair copy and probably due to the fact that it's a fixed point implementation that's meant to be relatively efficient. I, I did have some thoughts about running this within the USRP E310 um, instead of on a separate host uh, connected to the, the uh, SDR. I never got that far though. But again, what the code does is it decodes those packets, turns it into PCM data, and calls a subclass method with just raw 16-bit samples at eight kilohertz, which you can then you know, stream to disk, play through dev DSP or you know, what have you. And then there's one other thing that I added called the out of process proxy, which allows that instantiated class to, to run in a separate process, which is then connected to the main GNU radio flow graph process via pipes. So those calls to receive PDU and the calls back, the send PDU function callback, uh, are proxied across these pipes. So you can run your code essentially in a completely different process, thus further creating that separation between the front end flow graph and, and the back end business logic. And so what I did with all of the stuff that I put together was to create a proof of concept that inches towards this do-it-yourself open source trunk radio scanner with a web mobile web-based interface and it's written completely in Python. It's pretty basic, but what it can do is show you real-time site activity with all of the users uh, uh, on, on a given tower. It can monitor audio from those channels. You can choose to lock out or prioritize specific talk groups that you want to listen to, which is table stakes for, for commercial scanners, by the way. Uh, and then it also provides a nice visual feedback of the signal quality, basically how well is it able to decode these control channel and uh, traffic channel messages. Essentially, it's meant to be a playground so that I could start implementing user interface ideas that you know, really appeal to me and the way that I monitor these systems and what I, I want to hear. The architecture looks like this. The left-hand side of this diagram is the GNU radio process. It's the front end, the front end interface, um, and then the out of process proxy that sends all of the control channel and traffic channel messages through pipes to the scanner server process. That server process reads in metadata that I downloaded from, from radio reference with all of the, the different sites and talk groups of the system that I monitor most frequently. It then spawns a Python web server process that serves up static presentation data to the mobile client. Right, so the uh, mobile client connects to the web server, gets the HTML, CSS, and hilariously bad JavaScript because I don't like writing JavaScript, but then opens another connection to a port that is opened by the scanner server process that's sharing WebSockets messages. And that WebSockets message link uh, sends events and PCM data between the server process and the mobile client. 
So hopefully we'll get some audio here. Um, I took a couple of minutes of, of video of me playing with this thing. Um, doesn't look like there's going to be any uh, video here, I guess. That's, that's kind of unfortunate. Um, but what you would see, if you could see this video, is uh, traffic that is being monitored. So as traffic is, is uh, noticed on frequencies of the tower, a new row opens up. So you'll see these rows being created in the web page that indicate which talk group is uh, on, the chan uh, on the frequency, who owns that talk group, you know, what, what it maps to. Uh, the green background means that it's monitoring that channel, so you'll hear audio when somebody's transmitting. And then when you click the row, you get a, a set of buttons that say lock out this talk group or prioritize this talk group. And a locked out talk group shows up in gray, indicating that if it's encountered, it won't play. Uh, and then pressing priority, I think, puts a little star beside the name to indicate that's kind of a favorite. Um, so you get a pretty nice experience, uh, a pretty intuitive, user-friendly experience for monitoring these systems. Uh, and you can do it sort of from the, the comfort of your, your mobile phone. Oh, wait, it will play. Awesome. OK, great. I'm glad I, I, I hit that button. Uh, so, okay, so what you can see is uh, rows being added as traffic is detected on the frequencies of this given tower. Um, the green highlighted line is what's currently playing. It's the Austin Water Plant uh, talk group. Um, and I think at some point here, I click one of these rows, and you can see what happens when I click on a row. It opens up this sort of drawer of buttons underneath it any moment now. Uh, yeah, there it is. So I can click lockout group, and that, that group is now turned gray, meaning that it's locked out, and if it's eligible to be listened to, um, it won't play. And I just prioritized TCSO Adam. So, you know, Adam, Baker, Charlie. So Adam is the West Patrol of the Travis County Sheriff, so it's Travis County Sheriff Adam West. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, and so you can kind of imagine how you can pretty quickly create a, a really intuitive and flexible user interface without having to write a lot of custom code because it was provided there uh, in the base class. And you can see the flashing heart at the top indicating that it's seeing frame syncs and that the radio is actually working. And then those two quality bars that indicate basically how well the decoder is, um, uh, is able to error correct, and whether the, the CRCs match it and whatnot. It's, it's sort of a proxy for the signal quality. Whoops. I did not mean to do that. This is one of those Macs. How do I, how do I uh, make this big? How do I embiggen this? <laughs> That's sort of... Play? Well, that's th no. That'll teach me for touching somebody else's computer. Anyway, we'll go back to the slides. Um, this is all up on GitHub. Uh, there's the link there. It, it's pretty rough right now. I'm not going to lie. Like I said, I don't have a lot of free time to play with this. And I'm prioritizing pace over perfection, so I know there's a lot of deficiencies with it. But there's a lot of fun things that you could do with it. It's USRP E310 specific right now, as I mentioned. But there's nothing saying that you couldn't rewrite that front end. It wouldn't take a lot of work to support RTL SDRs or Air Spies or Lime SDR or what have you, as long as you get enough bandwidth from it that it's able to sort of uh, see all of the frequencies in, in the tower of interest at once. Um, and you don't need those FPGA-based DDCs. You know, there's, there's blocks, entry GNU radio blocks that do basically the same thing uh, in the CPU. Uh, so there's a, a couple of potential areas that I list here for feature additions, areas of improvement. The repo needs some TLC. Um, the JavaScript code is particularly uh, hilarious. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically it. If you're interested, I, I invite you to take a look. And so if you're, you know, driving around town and you, you stop to have a drink and you see some guy sitting outside with his laptop that's got a spectrum display on it and an antenna and a beer, that's, that's probably me. So stop by and say hello. And uh, that's it.
Thank you very much.